Start of Chapter 4 Total Guidance Many and All As promised, we will now combine I have yet many things to say unto you from verse 12 with He will guide you into all truth from John 16, 12 and 13. If the Christian still persists that the spirit of truth of this prophecy is the Holy Ghost, then ask him or her whether in their language does many means more than one? Also if all in the above verse means more than one? If you get a halting, wavering, hesitant yes, then close the book. It is not worth pursuing dialogues with opinionated fools. But if you get the answer yes with alacrity, then proceed. The one prophesied by Jesus was to unravel many things which he had left unsaid as well as to guide humanity into all truth. There are many problems facing mankind today for which we are fumbling for answers. Can you please give me one new thing that the alleged Holy Ghost gave to anybody in the past 2000 years which Jesus Christ had not already given in so many different words? I don't want many. I am looking for just one. No solution from Holy Ghost. Believe me, in my 40 years of questioning, I have not come across a single Christian with a single new truth inspired by the Holy Ghost. Yet the promise was that the coming Comforter, He will guide you into all truth. If the spirit of truth of this prophecy is the Holy Ghost, then every church and denomination and every born-again Christian is claiming the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Roman Catholics claim that they have the whole truth because of the so-called indwelling of the Holy Ghost. The Anglicans make the same claim and the Methodists, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Baptists, the Christadelphians, etc., etc., not forgetting the born-agains who claim to be numbering over 70 million in the United States alone. You have the right to demand solutions from them on the authority of the Holy Ghost for the problems listed below. Number 1. Alcohol Number 2. Gambling Number 3. Fortune telling Number 4. Idol worship Devil worship Number 5. Racism Number 6. Problem of surplus women, etc., etc. Problem of alcohol The Republic of South Africa with a small white population of 4 million among its total population of 30 million has over 300,000 alcoholics. In neighboring Zambia, Kenneth Konda calls such people drunkards. It is recorded that the colored in South Africa have five times the amount of alcoholics as any other race in the country. For the Indians and the Africans, no statistics are available for their respective drunkards. Jimmy Swaggart, the televangelist, record in his book Alcohol that the United States has 11 million alcoholics and 44 million heavy drinkers. And he, like a good Muslim, goes on to say that he sees no difference between the two. To him they are all drunkards. The rampant evil of drunkenness is universal. The Holy Ghost has not yet made its pronouncement on this evil through any church. Christendom winks at drunkenness on three flimsy pretenses based on the Holy Bible. A. Give strong drink, hard liquor to him who is perishing, one who is dying, and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Holy Bible, Proverbs, chapter 31, verses 6 to 7. A very good philosophy to keep the subject nations under subjugation, you will agree. His very first miracle. B. Jesus was no killjoy. The imbibers say he turned water into wine in his very first recorded miracle in the Bible. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and saith, Why thou hast kept the good wine until now? Holy Bible, John chapter 2 verse 7 to 10 Since this alleged miracle, wine continues to flow like water in Christendom. Sober advice. See, 
St. Paul the 13th self-appointed disciple of Christ, the real founder of Christianity, advises his new convert protege, Timothy, born of a Greek father and a Jewish mother. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Holy Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 23. The Christians accept all the Bible quotations on stimulating and intoxicating drinks given above as the infallible word of God. They believe that the Holy Ghost inspired the authors to pen such dangerous advices. Reverend Demolo seems to have some qualms about the verse. He says, It teaches us that if the body needs the stimulant of wine, it is right to take it in moderation. Abstinence, the only answer. There are thousands of Christian priests who have been lured into alcoholism by sipping and so-called mild wine in the church rite of the Holy Communion. Islam is the only religion on the face of the earth which prohibits intoxicants in toto. The Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam had said, Whatever intoxicates in greater quantity is forbidden even in smaller quantity. There is no excuse in the house of Islam for a nip or a tot. The Kitab al-Haqq, the Book of Truth, one of the titles of the Holy Quran condemned in the strongest terms not only the evil of alcohol, but also items 2, 3 and 4, namely gambling, fortune-telling and idol worship with just a single stroke. O ye who believe, innam al-khamr wal maysir, most certainly intoxicant and gambling, wal ansab, dedication of stones, wal azlam, and divination of arrows. Rijsum min amali shaitan are an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihun. Shun such abomination that ye may prosper. Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 93. When this verse was revealed, wine barrels were emptied in the streets of Medina, never to be refilled. This simple, straightforward directive has created of the Muslim Ummah religious community the biggest society of teetotalers in the world. USA fails with prohibition. The question arises, how is it that this spirit of truth, the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam, succeeded with one verse whereas mighty America with the brain power of the nation and the money power of the government supported by its powerful propaganda machinery, failed with prohibition, the law outlawing alcohol. Who coerced the American nation to enact prohibition? Which Arab nation threatened this mighty power with if you do not prohibit alcohol in your country? We will not supply you with oil. Not the Arabs, as there was no such thing as oil as a political instrument in the hands of the Arabs during the 20s to act the United States. It was an intellectual awareness among the American founding fathers based on study and statistics which brought them to the conclusion that intoxicants must be banned. They failed, notwithstanding the fact that the overwhelming majority of the nation was Christian and that it was they who had voted their congressmen into power. It is rightly said that that which comes from the brain intellectually tickles the brain. But that which comes from the heart and soul of a man will move the heart. The verse just quoted above from the Holy Quran on prohibition had and has the power for change. We will allow Thomas Carlyle to reveal the source of that power. If a book comes from the heart, it will contrive to reach other hearts. All art and autocraft are small amount to that. One would say the primary character of the Quran is this of its genuineness of its being a bona fide book. High Spirituality, a Source of Power All the beautiful thoughts, words and expressions, never mind how artistically constructed, remain like ringing bells or clanking cymbals unless they are backed up by a powerful personality charged with high spirituality. And that type of super spirituality comes only as Jesus put it through fasting and prayer. Matthew chapter 17 verse 21 Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam practiced what he preached 
After his demise, someone asked his dear wife Aisha Siddiqa ta'ala anha about the lifestyle of her husband. She said, he was the Qur'an in action. He was the walking Qur'an. He was the talking Qur'an. He was the living Qur'an. If these men and women, noble, intelligent, and certainly not less educated than the fishermen of Galilee, had perceived the slightest sign of earthliness, deception, or want of faith in the teacher himself, Muhammad's hopes of moral regeneration and social reform would all have been crumbled to dust in a moment. Spirit of Islam by Sayyid Amir Ali Critics Hero If it is said that these are the words of a devoted believer about his beloved, then let us hear what a sympathetic Christian critic had to say about his hero prophet. A poor, hard-toiling, ill-provided man, careless of what vulgar men toil for, not a bad man, I should say, something better in him than hunger of any sort, or these wild Arab men, fighting and jostling three and twenty years at his hand, in close contact with him always, would not have reverenced him so. They called him prophet, you say. Why, he stood there face to face with them, bare, not enshrined in any mystery, visibly clouting his own cloak, cobbling his own shoes, fighting, counselling, ordering in the midst of them. They must have seen what kind of a man he was. Let him be called what you like. No emperor with his tiaras was obeyed as this man in a cloak of his own clouting. During three and twenty years of rough actual trial, I find something of a veritable hero necessary for that of itself. Hero and Hero Worship by Thomas Carlyle Problem of Racism For he, the Spirit of Truth, will guide you into all truth. Holy Bible, John chapter 16, verse 13 Not without a system it is very easy for the followers of any religion to talk glibly about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, but how is this beautiful idea to be implemented? How to devise a system to bring mankind into a single brotherhood? Five times a day, every Muslim is obligated to gather together at the local mosque to strengthen himself spiritually. The black and the white, the rich and the poor, people of different nationalities, of varying hues are made to rub shoulders in the daily Salat, the Muslim at prayer. Once a week, that is on Fridays, he has to congregate at the cathedral mosque, the Dharma Masjid for a wider gathering from the surrounding districts. And twice a year during the two Eids at still a larger venue, preferably in the open air for a vaster communion, and at least once in a lifetime at the Kaaba, the central mosque in Mecca, for an international gathering where one can witness the blonde-haired Turk, the Ethiopian, the Chinese, the Indian, the American and the African all get leveled up in the same pilgrim's garb of two unseen sheets. Where is there such a great leveler in the religious rites of other faiths? The infallible precept as enunciated in the Book of God is that the only standard recognized by God is on the basis of one's conduct one's behavior towards one's fellow human beings and not because of one's race or riches. These are the only true bases on which the kingdom of God can be established. All this does not mean that the Muslim is immaculate, that he is altogether free from the sickness of racism, but you will find the Muslim the least racist of all the religious groupings strutting the world today. Problem of Surplus Women Nature seems to be at war with mankind. It appears that it wants to take revenge for his cleverness. Man will not listen to the healthy, practical solution to his problems, which a beneficial benevolent providence offers him. So it says, go simmer in your soup, in a manner of speaking. It is an accepted fact that at birth the ratio of male and female is about equal everywhere. But in child mortality, more males die than females. Amazing, the weaker sex, at any given time, there are more widows in the world than widowers. Every civilized nation has a surplus of women. Great Britain, 4 million. Germany, 5 million. Soviet Russia, 7 million, etc. But a solution acceptable to the problem of the mighty United States of America, 
will be a solution acceptable to nations everywhere. The statistics of this most sophisticated nation on earth is more readily verifiable. America, oh America. We learn that the USA has a surplus of 7 to 8 million women. It means that if every man in America got married, there would still be 7 to 800,000 women left over, women who would be unable to get their share of a husband. One thing we do know, and that is that every man will never get married for so many different reasons. Man gets cold feet and finds many excuses. A woman, even if frigid, would not mind getting married. She would marry even if it is just for shelter and protection. But the American problem of surplus women is compounded. 98% of its prison population is male. Then they have 25 million sodomites. Euphemistically, they call them gays, a once beautiful word meaning happy and joyous, now perverted. America does everything in a big way. She produces everything mighty, mighty in promoting God and also mighty in promoting the devil. Let us for once join the mighty televangelist now fallen Jimmy Swaggart in his prayer in his well-researched book, Homosexuality. He cries, America. God will judge you, meaning that God will destroy you. For if he does not judge you, destroy you, he, God, might have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for their hasty, utter destruction because of their practice of homosexuality or their wanton gratification of unnatural lust. New York as an example. The city of New York has one million more women than men. Even if the total male population in this city mustered enough courage to unite with the opposite sex in matrimony, there would still remain one million women without husbands. But to make things worse, it is reputed that one third of the male population in this city is gay, homosexuals, sodomites. The Jews, a very vociferous lot in every controversy, remain quiet as mice for fear of being labelled backward Easterners. The church, with their millions of born-again votaries claiming to be the dwelling houses of the Holy Coast, are also silent on this topic. The founders of the Mormon church, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, claiming a new revelation in 1830 preached and practiced unlimited polygamy to solve the problem of surplus women. The present-day prophets of Mormonism have abrogated the teaching of their church fathers to placate American prejudice on the subject of polygamy. What is the poor American, Western, European surplus women to do? They have literally gone to the dogs. Only solution, restricted and regulated polygamy. Al-Amin, the prophet of truth, the spirit of truth, under inspiration of God supplies the solution to their unfortunate plight. God ordains. Marry women of your choice, two or three or four. But if you fear that you will not be able to deal justly with them, then marry only one. Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 3. The Western world fiends tolerance towards the millions of sodomites and lesbians in their midst. It is a joking matter in the West for a man to keep a dozen mistresses and beget a dozen bastard children every year. Such lecherous creatures are proudly labelled as studs. Let him sow his wild oats, but don't hold him responsible, says the West. Islam says, make man responsible for his pleasures. There is a type of man who is prepared to take an extra responsibility, and there is a type of woman who is prepared to share a husband. Why place obstacles in their way? You mock at polygamy, which was practiced by the prophets of God as recorded in the Holy Bible. You forget that Solomon the wise had a thousand wives and concubines as recorded in the good book. 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 3 A healthy solution to your momentous problem and yet you smugly wink at the gratification of unnatural lust by sodomites and lesbians. What a perversion! Polygamy was practiced by the Jews and the pagans in the times of Jesus. He did not say a single word against it. Not his fault. The Jews gave him no peace to propound solutions. His was a natural cry. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, 
he will guide you into all truth. John chapter 16 verse 13 Comforter to be a man If I take the liberty of quoting the prophecy under discussion with an emphasis on the pronouns, you will agree without any persuasion that the coming comforter was to be a man and not a ghost. How about when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Holy Bible, John chapter 16 verse 13. Please count the number of he's in the above verse. There are seven, seven masculine pronouns in a single verse. There is not another verse in the 66 books of the Protestant Bible or in the 73 books of the Catholic Bible with seven masculine pronouns or seven feminine pronouns or with seven neuter genders. You will agree that so many masculine pronouns in one verse ill befits a ghost, holy or not. Non-stop interpolations when this point of the seven masculine pronouns in a single verse of the Bible was mooted by the Muslims in India in their debates with the Christian missionaries, the Urdu version of the Bible had the pronouns presently changed to she, 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 so that the Muslims could not claim that this prophecy referred to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a man. This Christian tishanary, deception, I have seen in the Urdu Bible myself. This is a common trickery by the missionaries more especially in the vernacular. The very latest views I have stumbled across is in the Afrikaans Bible. On the very verse under discussion, they have changed the word truster, comforter, to wursprach, mediator, and interpolated the verse diehelikis, meaning the Holy Ghost, which phrase no Bible scholar has ever dared to interpolate into any of the multifarious English versions. No, not even the Jehovah's Witnesses. This is how the Christians manufacture God's word. Nine masculine pronouns. The only other place an author has unknowingly used so many masculine pronouns for this mighty messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is given below. His gentle disposition, his austerity of conduct, the severe purity of his life, his scrupulous refinement, his ever ready helpfulness towards the poor and the weak his noble sense of honor, his unflinching fidelity. His stern sense of duty had won him, among his compatriots, the high and enviable designation of Al-Amin, the trusty, spirit of Islam by Sayyid Amir Ali. Al-Amin, the faithful, the trustworthy, even the spirit of truth, John chapter 14, verse 17. This expression is a figurative way of saying that speaking truth would be so characteristic of him that people would regard him as truth personified, exactly as Jesus salam, said about himself, I am the way, the truth and the life, John chapter 14 verse 6, that these noble qualities are personified in me, follow me. But when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, John chapter 16 verse 13, then you must follow him, but prejudices die hard, therefore we must work harder. But believe me, with the laser truth that Allah has given us, we can change the world with only a fraction of the energy that the Christian is expending. Source of Revelation How bike when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Holy Bible, John chapter 16 verse 13 I have consistently been using the King James Version in my biblical quotations, but for greater clarity, I give below alternate rendering from some different versions of the above emphasized sentence. For he will not speak on his own authority, but will tell only what he hears, the New English Bible. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears, New International Version. For he will not be presenting his own ideas but he will be passing on to you what he has heard, the living Bible. This spirit of truth, this prophet of truth, Al-Amin, will not be speaking spiritual truths on his own impulse, but he will speak on the same basis as his previous comforter. Jesus had spoken, For I speak not from myself, 
but the Father that sent me. He hath given me the commandment what I should say and what I should speak. Even as the Father hath said unto me, so I speak. Holy Bible, John chapter 12, verses 49 to 50. In an identical manner, God Almighty testifies his revelation to his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nor does he say aught of his own desire. It is no less than inspiration sent down to him. He was taught by one mighty in power. Surah Najm, chapter 53, verses 3 to 5. This is how God communicated with all his chosen messengers, whether Abraham, Moses or Jesus, it would be absurd to think that the Spirit of Truth is the Holy Ghost, because we are told that He will not speak from Himself, but what He hears, surely not from Himself. God, a Trinity? It is universally accepted in Christendom, all Orthodox Christians who believe in what they call the Holy Trinity, that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But they are not three gods, but one God. Let an erudite Christian theologian, like the Reverend Demelo, tell us of this indivisibility, indissolubility of the Christian's triune God, commenting on the we will come of John chapter 14 verse 23. He says, Where the Son is, there of necessity is the Father also, as well as the Spirit, for the three are one, being different forms of the subsistence and manifestation of the same divine being. This passage illustrates that the person of the Holy Trinity are inseparable and contain one another. Please don't worry, you are not really expected to understand the above verbiage. In short, the Christian believes that the three, I beg your pardon, the Christian says one, all the three are supposed to be omnipresent and omniscient and as such lead us to an amusing and ridiculous conclusion. Jesus, according to the Christians, agonized on the cross at Calvary. Being inseparable, the Father and the Holy Ghost also must have agonized with the Son. And when he died, the other two died with him. Little wonder we hear the cry in the West, God is dead. Don't laugh. All this imposes on us a more somber responsibility of extricating our Christian brethren from the spiritual quagmire into which they are wallowing. End of chapter 4